Hey there, everybody. This is Corey Huff with The Abundant Artist, and I'm very glad you're here today. Uh, I'm excited to chat with you for the next couple of hours about uh, websites and selling art online. Uh, I'm sorry, my camera angle is a little funky today because I've got my computer in a weird place. Okay, and there's apparently a lot of sunlight. Uh, so today, I'm just going to turn on my, my uh, presets here. Okay. Um, today we're going to dive into what makes an effective artist website. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking, uh, like this is not a lecture. Uh, this is a casual working session so I can answer people's questions, perhaps show some examples and give people a chance to uh, get their websites in good shape. Uh, if you are uh, over in the, on the events page watching this, um, feel free to, uh, let's see, I'm going to post a link over on the event, event page. Uh, let's see. Hey there, Julia. How you doing? Good. How are you doing, Corey? Good. Glad to have you here. Um, everybody, this is Julia. Uh, I'm gesturing to my left, but I think she's actually down below, right there on the screen. Okay. Um, Julia is a, a, an artist that I know who I've worked with a little bit, and she's also has a background in web design, and uh, I thought she she asked if she could contribute, so uh, I thought, sure, let's let's have her on. So thanks for, for, ha for being here, Julia. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I'm happy to help. Awesome. So if you are on the events page uh, watching this thing, uh, over on the right-hand side, uh, there is a, uh, a little description of the event under the details section, and there is a link there to uh, a page on my website uh, that will give you the ability to download the artist website checklist. And I'm just going to use Google's handy sh screen sharing tool here to uh, show you what I mean. So if we go back to uh, theabundantartist.com slash the-artist-website-checklist. It's a terrible URL. But uh, the checklist here has a pretty good list of all of the things that you are going to want to have uh, on your artist website. So then you can click on that and download that document or just uh, open it up there on the web page and follow along with us. So uh, I just want to check in real quick. If you can, if you're watching and you can uh, hear me or see me, if you could just comment on the events page or the Q&A app and let me know that you can hear me, that would be super awesome. I just want to make sure everybody can hear me. Just gonna give it a second. Make sure everybody can see me. I haven't done a live hangout on air for a while. Make sure that I've got it going. Okay. Oh, there's some people. Jutta, Juta, Layla. Okay. So there's a few people joining us live here. Jan. Hey, everybody. Um, okay, it looks like there's 50 people watching, so people are figuring it out. Okay, great. Uh, so when it comes to the website stuff, uh, I want to make sure that you have all of the tools that you need. So there's a comment from somebody that says, uh, where did it go? There was a really good one in here. It says, okay, I have Elegant Themes Divi theme with a WooCommerce plugin. Some of my prints are portraits and some are landscape. The thumbnails of the small print portraits look great. The larger prints look, look landscape look insignificant. Is it possible I have two different sizes of thumbnails? Is there a plugin? Colleen, that's a great question. Uh, I, I don't know that I can easily answer that for you. Um, I'm not a web developer per se. Um, I have developers on my team. Um, I do know that with any website, Having a page where you've got landscape and uh, 
skyscraper format thumbnails is really challenging. Um, and for, for various technical reasons, it's hard to have them all together on the same page. It's a little bit more of an advanced concept uh, for most websites. Um, Julia, is there a good way to handle that? Do you know? Um, so by default, WooCommerce will um, cr hard crop, I believe, um, mm -hmm. your images so that they're squares. Um, and you can change those dimensions. But um, as far as I know, there isn't a way to do um, landscape and, um, well, I guess, I guess I need a little clarification on the mm -hmm. question. So, is it just, are you, are you, is that, I don't know who's asked that question, but, um, and if they're here or not. It was Colleen Stratton. Okay, so Colleen, yeah. um, is the problem that you, you have both and they just look bad, or you can't get both? You have, like, one format or the other. Mm -hmm. um, well, so I, I, I ran into this problem a few times building WooCommerce site, uh, sites myself with, with Divi. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think the, the problem is that, like, with, with a lot of, you know, with every artist, they have different dimension pieces. Sure. And you want to be able to display all of those pieces on a single page. Uh, but if you do it by default, like, with the default settings with WooCommerce and Divi, you know, all of the thumbnails are the same size, which means that your landscape images are going to look better than your, uh, whatever, the other format, the vertically aligned image. Uh, so then, you know, when you shove all of those into the same size thumbnail, uh, they look bad, and there's no easy way to have different size thumbnails on the same right. page. I'm actually logging in right now to my site mm -hmm. um, to take a look because... I think there's a way around it, um, and it's something that I've actually been working on on my own site because I recently decided I don't want all the same size uh, thumbnails or um, proportions, right. I should say. So mm -hmm. um, if you go to WooCommerce settings in the main mm -hmm. WordPress menu, and, and let me know, Corey, like, if you don't want to get into like this type of granular stuff, I don't know uh -huh. like what level of stuff you want to go into. Yeah, just give her, just give a quick, like, you know, three steps or something on where to get to the settings, um, and then what you might need to do, what's, what level of work is entailed. We, we maybe not get into all the nuts and bolts of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I do know if you go to, yeah, as you were saying, WooCommerce, and then... If you go to settings, settings and then mm -hmm. just... Display. down towards the bottom there's a section called product images if you mm -hmm. want I can share my screen um, I don't know if you yeah, have... why don't you do that why don't you do that briefly do you know how I do that <laughs> oh, <laughs> so in the hangout uh, on the left hand side there's a green uh, button that says screen share okay yeah so let's see here and while she's doing that, I want to remind everybody, again, go over to, if you're on the events page, uh, over on the right-hand side in the details section, there's a link to the AbundantArtist.com uh, artist website checklist. And uh, while she's pulling that up, I'll just show you briefly again uh, what it looks like. So here's the checklist. Um, it's got the logo on it, and then it goes. We, we just go through and talk about all the steps that are involved in your in your making sure that you've got a website that works for you as an artist. So, uh, Julia, do you have that up? Um, I do. Can you see okay. it? Okay. Yep. Okay. So uh, I'm not sure how many people are using WordPress, but WordPress is kind of my area of expertise, and that's what I chose to build my art website on, and. Um, I definitely recommend it. It's very easy to use. Um, but anyways, um, WooCommerce is a plugin um, for WordPress that basically really easily allows you to add a shopping cart. Um, and also, um, you can add a, a gateway, a payment gateway like PayPal or one of the other dozens and dozens of um, gateways. But anyways, um, over on the left-hand menu, we've got WooCommerce. You go to settings, and then you go to display up here, and you scroll down towards the bottom. And what I've figured out is you can uncheck these hard crop boxes, and it's a good idea to have some kind of dimension 
in here. Um, but what I've done is I've left the height blank. Um, so all of my images are going to be the same width. They're going to be 175. Um, some of them might be, you know, 100 pixels high. Some of them might be 200 pixels high, um, depending on the orientation of that, that particular piece of artwork. So um, that's kind of what I figured out works for me. Um, I haven't yet, I, I need to, I just actually figured this out a few days ago, so I haven't actually applied it to all of my new artwork, because the thing is when you do um, upload images um, to WordPress to use in, in WooCommerce, um, anytime you change the settings here under product images, you're going to have to go and re-upload all of the images in your catalog, basically. Right. Um, Julie, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna interrupt for a second. Uh, whoever has their phone ringing in the background, if you can mute yourself, that'd be good. Uh, and just courtesy to everybody else. Yep. Thank you. Go ahead, Julia. That was pretty much it. Um, but you know, you can um, you know is. This is kind of a workaround um, so that you can get, you know, both the portrait and the landscape um, mm -hmm. view on the front end of, um, you know, your catalog pages, your product archive pages. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you wanted to, you could use a little bit of CSS, um, you know, to, to make it look perfect. Um, you know, and Colleen, um, you know, you're welcome to contact me if you want, mm -hmm. you know, to ask me. To, to look at your particular issue. Right. Cool. Okay. Um, so now that, thank you for jumping in and doing that, Julia. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to back up a little bit. Uh, there's a, a handful of questions coming in about various topics, and I want to see if we can address uh, some of those questions as we're um, as we're working through them. So I want to share. I'm going to share my screen here again, and I'm just going to show oops, the checklist again. So one of the things that I, that I see, uh, a mistake that I see a lot of artists make with their websites, and Julie, I'm sure you've seen this a lot as a designer, is people think, oh, I want a website, so they go to you know, squarespace.com or wordpress.com or whatever, and they sign up and they start building a website. Uh, and the problem, of course, is just like with a piece of art, if you're going to make something good, you actually have to do some research and some planning beforehand. Um, now, there are artists who do intuitive painting, and, and people will tell me, well, I don't, I don't think about my art, I just paint it. But the thing is, you've done some training, and some, uh, you've taken classes, and, and all kinds of prep work before you sat down and started painting on the canvas. The same thing applies to websites. You need to actually get some information in your head, and maybe some, some skills and, and research before you actually build the website. So uh, in the checklist that you can download on the website, uh, you want to go, what I always recommend to artists is before you ever start thinking about building your website, you should go out to the internet and look for as many artists as you can find whose work is at least somewhat similar to yours. And you want to get a range of artists from famous artists all the way to, you know, nobodies. And and a lot of our, sometimes when I have artists do this exercise, they'll they'll go and find five examples. I don't want you to find five examples. I want you to find thirty or forty examples, uh, because it will force you to go and look and see how many you can find. It'll, it'll force you to get out of your comfort zone and out of the the regular network of people that you usually look at, and see what's actually good out there. Um, now you can start with some simple things like doing a Google search for artists in your style. Uh, you can also look at the other, like look at the blogs for the artists that you read, and look at their blog roles to see which artists they're reading and following. Um, same thing with people in your social networks. If you're on Facebook or Instagram, look at the artists that you're friends with or following. Look at their websites. Look at the websites of the people that they're friends with and following, um, so that you can start to get an example of what's good and what isn't good. Um, does that make sense to, to you and to everybody else on the, on the call? Does that make sense to you guys? Can I stress something, too, um, just with the quantity? I mean, looking at 30 is um, a really great goal because mm -hmm. in my experience, when I was doing research for 
my website and looking at other artists, I found that, I mean, I'm, of course, going to be picky because I've been doing web design for 12 years, mm -hmm. um, but, and, and overly critical, <laughs> but um, I found that 90% of, you know, artists that were like me, their websites were mediocre or, or terrible. Um, so the more websites you can look at, the better, and you'll get an idea of what's working, what's not working, and what, you know, what your goals are going to be. You know, mm -hmm. spend spend hours doing it. You know, don't spend 20 minutes doing it. Spend a day if you can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So those of you who are on the call now, we've got uh, let's see, Jan and Jamie and Antonia, Ant Antonia, however you say your name. I, I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. Uh, everybody else that's on, uh, you know, feel free to jump in and ask any questions you might have as we sort of work our way through the checklist. Uh, I, you know, I, some of you I know, some of you I don't know, so I'm glad you were able to jump in. Uh, we're only able to have 10 people on the call live, I believe, so I, I appreciate those who were here early enough to jump in. Uh, so consider yourselves uh, in the room, so to speak. And feel free to raise your hands and ask questions or just jump in and ask questions. Uh, if we get unruly, I might boot some people, but I don't think we'll have that problem with any of you. Uh, so, yeah, feel free to, to ask any questions you might have. And don't think any of your questions are dumb because uh, I'm sure for every one of you that has a question, there's five other artists that have the same question. So, uh, yeah, let's treat this like an informal working session and make sure we get you the, the help that you need. Okay. Uh, so the other thing that I'll, I'll say is, uh, so there's doing the re there's the research side and understanding uh, what other artists are doing and what the possibilities are. Um, the other thing that you want to understand is what is your brand as an artist, um, because that's going to affect your design. I think most artists in general are going to stick with a pretty simplistic design, a plain white background. Uh, with the focus on the images of your art and maybe a few pictures of you. Um, but there's also design, there's design elements that give people subtle clues as to whether or not, you know, you are a luxury brand or if you are a, a mid-tier brand, you know, and, and be really honest with yourself. Not every artist is a luxury brand. Some art is relatively inexpensive, and that's okay. You can still make a living with inexpensive art. You just have to sell more of it. So it just depends on which kind of artist you want to be and how you want your image portrayed to the world, you should give some thought to that as well. Um, in the checklist, there is a couple of links to uh, well, some blog posts where I talk about the ideas of uniquity, um, where I talk about how to, how to discover your brand and how to figure that out. A lot of times, it's, it's very difficult for early career artists to express what their brand is uh, because you don't really know yourself and you're still figuring it out, but uh, give yourself a break. You know, think about it and spend some time on it. Do some homework on it, and then and then start moving forward because you'll really discover your brand uh, after you start making contact with customers. But I, I do think you should put some thought into it when you're getting started. <clears throat> and then the other thing that I'll say, uh, and I really love. Uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, how does this thing work again? Uh, so. I see a lot of artists with existing websites who are they're, they're doing themselves a huge disservice by not having some sort of traffic tracking service installed on their website. And the, the very best thing you can do, if, if you are redesigning an existing website or starting a new website from your existing website, is to have Google Analytics or some other website tracking service set up because you'll be able to see exactly which pages on your website are the most popular. Um, and a lot of times it won't be the ones you think it is. And you'll also be able to see where people are falling down. If you have an e-commerce shop set up on your site and you see that a lot of people are putting stuff into the cart but then not actually buying, uh, then that might spur you to take a look at what your checkout process looks like. Um, and then as you're redesigning, you can use the data from your Google Analytics account to, to, to make decisions about the redesign of your site. So uh, that's sort of the preliminary stuff that I always go through when I'm thinking about changes to my website. Um, there's also some really cool tools like, uh, like user, what is it called, Feedback Army. 
Uh, feedbackarmy.com is a really cool tool where you can pay, I think, uh, I think you pay 20 bucks or something like that, and you get three people to go through your website, and there's a screencast recording of them talking about what they think your website is about and what their experience is on your website, and then they email you those videos, and you get it back within 48 hours, I think, or 72 hours, um, so that's pretty cool uh, that you can, that something like that is so inexpensive. Um, There's another one um, called usertesting.com that mm -hmm. my, my uh, employer used in the past and was really helpful for our clients. Similar yeah. service. Yeah, absolutely. Now, of course, the best feedback you can get is if you're talking to your actual customers and they're telling you things about your website. But uh, look, that's somewhat obvious, but I just wanted to mention it. All right. Corey, so, do you have yeah. any um, recommendations, like any sort of specific tutorials you like for Google Analytics? Um, because I think that can be a little intimidating at first, and I'm mm -hmm. certainly not an expert in Google Analytics, and I certainly have things to learn as well. Sure, yeah. Um, no tutorials per se. So the, fir the first thing, like if you're installing Google Analytics, most of the good website tools, WordPress, Squarespace, Shopify, etc., they make it really easy to install Google Analytics on your website. It's literally, you know, with WordPress, there's a plugin, and you just click a button, and it takes you through some authentication uh, to get it installed, to get it set up on your website. Uh, Squarespace and and Shopify do the same thing. I'm not sure about other uh, services, but th they do make it relatively easy. Um, and then, as far as learning the basics of Google Analytics. Uh, maybe after I post this video, I will uh, throw some some links up in the notes. I, I, I have some resources that I use. Um, the The Google Analytics training that Google offers uh, is pretty thorough, although it's kind of dry. Uh, but there's a series of nine or ten videos that you can watch that will show you the basics of how to use Google Analytics. Um, maybe that's the subject for a future training. Okay. Um, so, looking at the next step, like, before we get into, you know, should I do this or should I do that with my website, it's thinking about, am I going to build the website myself, am I going to hire somebody to build it, or am I going to use one of those prefabricated website companies, uh, like uh, Fine Art Studios Online or Other People's Pixels or Squarespace or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, there, each of them have some advantages and disadvantages. I think anybody who has a budget you should hire a designer. Like, it should be a no-brainer because a designer is going to do a better job at building your website than you are. Um, and realistically, uh, to get a good design done, you're probably going to look uh, somewhere in the neighborhood between $2,000 and $5,000. Um, anything less than that is either going to be not very good or it's going to be uh, a template design that... You could maybe do yourself if you have the technical skills, and maybe you're just paying somebody to, to do that if you don't have the technical skills. But a good design uh, by an experienced professional is probably going to be in the $2,000 to $5,000 range, if not higher, uh, depending on which designer you hire. And I have a comment about that. Um, mm -hmm. If you do decide to hire someone um, to do your website for you, make sure that they're going to include in that, in that price um, time with you to teach you the basics of what you need to do to maintain your site so you don't have to call them up or pay them to add a new painting that you just did. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You've got to do that yourself. Yeah, there is no reason whatsoever at this point in internet technology to have to pay somebody to add new content to your website. If you take a picture and you want to upload that picture to your website, if you want to write a blog post or make some changes to your mailing address, whatever. Um, every website, every contemporary website service gives you the ability to easily edit your website content. Uh, if you can do things like upload attachments to an email and use Microsoft Word, uh, you should be able to edit the content of your website. Um, so when it comes to, okay, so if you can't hire a designer, then you're either going to build a website yourself or, or use one of those template, template services like Squarespace. Uh, building the website yourself, I, I usually recommend using something like WordPress. 
uh, and this question comes up all the time, the difference between WordPress.com and WordPress.org. Uh, WordPress.com is a blogging website that will allow you to set up a free blog, um, and a lot of their uh, free blog templates look like full-fledged websites. Um, that's great if you, because uh, it's free, except for the domain name, and uh, you can uh, just get, get started. They strip away a lot of features on WordPress.com, so it makes it easy to get set up, but there's a limit to what you're able to do, and I don't believe that WordPress.com allows you to do e-commerce, like you can't sell stuff from that website. Uh, then the, what, what happens is WordPress.com is run by a company called Automatic, and Automatic makes the WordPress software available for anybody who wants to, to download for free, set up on their own hosting service, and, uh, and, and build the website themselves. Um, now, getting it set up, there's a tutorial on my website. Uh, if you're looking at the checklist uh, in the uh, section on self-hosted versus artist website services, there is a link to uh, a tutorial that I put together on how to build your own website in Bluehost, or how to, how to get WordPress set up in Bluehost. Um, and then the, the third option, setting up, uh, you're using one of the website template services like Squarespace or, or Shopify or any of that kind of stuff. If you do not have te a technical inclination, if, you, you know, if, if all that stuff just really confuses you or you just don't have the time, um, and you don't, but you still don't have a budget, then I would recommend going with Shopify or Squarespace. I think those are two of my favorite services right now. Um, there are a lot of companies out there that specialize in building websites for artists. Like, you know, there's the, the other people's pixels and fine art studios online and all that kind of stuff. Those companies are okay. Um, my concern is that those companies are so small that they're going to fall behind in the technology that's available. Um, I think Fine Art Studios Online does a good job. They've, they've recently refreshed all, the te all their templates to be mobile-ready mobile, mobile ready and uh, have a lot of features that, that maybe they were missing for a little while. Um, but they are trying to be all-in-one services for artists when at some point in your marketing career, in your business career, you're going to need to split up your website and your, your technology solutions into specialized solutions. Um, Fine Art Studios Online has a mailing list service and, uh, and some other things like that. Eventually, you're going to have to move to a more advanced mailing list service like MailChimp or Infusionsoft. Um, so it's just a matter of, of cost and benefit. Um, I usually recommend new clients going with Shopify or Squarespace. Okay, I've talked a lot. Uh, I'm going to look at the events page here and see what questions or comments people are throwing up based on what I've said here. And anybody that's in the room, feel free to uh, pop in with any questions you might have about anything I've said so far. Let's see. Carmen Fairless says he just started using Squarespace and their help, their customer support is awesome. So that's good. Uh, let's see. Uh, Betsy said, Betsy Judge, you got your question. Would love to hear more about adding a shop page onto websites. I'm interested in analytics info too. Cool. Uh, let's see. So, uh, Layla, hopefully you got, oh, it looks like you're in here. Okay. Um, let's see. Alan says, I started with a website called Splintlemania, hand painted paintings that are black light 3D paintings. Um, Okay, we'll get to we'll get to your stuff here in a second, Alan. We're going to get into some some technical stuff a little later. Uh, Linda says I use a self-hosted WordPress, run it all myself, but that's because I have an associate's degree in computer science. Nice. Um, figuring out how to, how to attract clients. Yes, we're going to get into that. Let's see. Brad Blackman says I'm here, kind of printing out the checklist and heading to the cafeteria. Okay, awesome. Let's see. Okay, people are asking me to take a look at their websites. We'll definitely get to that here in a minute. All right. So once you've got the basics, like if you figured out if you're going to build the website yourself or hire somebody to do it, um, you need to worry about hosting. And um, hosting is a thing that frustrates and confuses me, uh, so I can only imagine how frustrating and confusing it is to 
as somebody who doesn't live this all day long. Um, web hosting is uh, basically your your any all, all websites live on something called a server. A server is just a computer, a specialized type of computer. And your computer, when it connects to the internet, it's going to go out there and and those domain name those domain names you have like coreyhuff.com or theabundantartist.com, uh, those those are those are your website's address. And the computer goes out looking for that address. And these servers, the, these specialized computers, uh, they talk to your computer and say, okay, here's the the files that hold theabundantartist.com, and here's all the information on that website. So you have to uh, hire or buy a server. Don't buy a server uh, unless you know exactly what you're doing. It, just don't do it. Uh, and so you're going to pay for a hosting service, and this is where uh, this is where things get tricky, because hosting is one of those things that is, that is as good as you can pay for. Uh, if you're paying for cheap hosting that's like six or seven bucks a month, uh, you're going to get six or seven dollars worth of month uh, a month worth of service. It's going to be it's not going to be all that great. Um, I used Bluehost for years when I started theabundantartist.com because I didn't want to pay for something more expensive. Um, Tiffany, I, saw, I see your questions. I will, uh, I will get to your question here in a little bit. There's a lot there. Uh, I just want to make sure we're working through uh, things in, in the right order. Okay. Uh, so, and, and you can certainly post here too. Uh, so, yeah, cheap hosting is cheap hosting. Uh, the more you pay for hosting, generally speaking, the higher quality you're going to get. Uh, I use, right now, I use a company called, uh, now I forget the uh, name of my host, Web Synthesis. Websynthesis.com is the host of theabundantartist.com, the, the blog and homepage, and then I use a different service for my courses page, which we can get into later. But uh, for that, for my hosting for that, I pay about $75 a month. And uh, it's 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 because I have a lot of traffic and a lot of images and media on my website. So basically, uh, the jump between entry level hosting at seven bucks a month is going to be up to around twenty five to thirty dollars a month. So when your if your website starts going down a lot um, and you're seeing consistent traffic to your website, it probably means that your website is starting to starting to become too big for shared hosting or the cheap shared hosting that you're using right now. Um, so just keep that in mind uh, as you're budgeting and thinking about your website. Eventually you're going to have to move to more expensive hosting. I started out, I, I have Bluehost too, and I started out with the more basic um, plan, I think, which was around $7 a month. And mm -hmm. I think for someone just starting out who doesn't have much traffic, that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, just because I have several domain names that I own and I have more than one website, um, about six months ago, I upgraded to their business plan, which I think mm -hmm. is about like twenty dollars a month. I think it's two fifty a year. Um, but yeah, I think the, the the cheaper one is probably fine. I recommend Bluehost too. Um, yeah. They have really good customer service inside the United States, which is um, very nice to have. Yep. Okay. Um, so then. The, on the by the way, on the artist website checklist, uh, if you're looking for some idea, like if you decide that you want to go with WordPress, uh, there is a list on the checklist on the checklist of some WordPress themes that I recommend and some tutorials that I've done on how to build a site on WordPress and uh, a basic site and uh, what themes I recommend. So, okay, um, then the next step after getting your website like figuring out the logistics of the basic uh, of hosting and all of that stuff. Um, if you've done your research and you have a good idea of what you like and what you, what seems to work, um, one of the like uh, translating what you want into something that's actually on the web is actually a huge challenge. Um, it's it's probably the biggest challenge that designers have. Um, and Julie, you can probably back me up on this. Like a client will say, "I want." X, Y, and Z, and the designer puts it together, and the client, uh, the client looks at it and says, "Oh, actually, that's that's not what I want at all." Um, and maybe you can talk about that challenge and why that happens. Um, yeah, and the other thing to throw in that kind of complicates things is, you know, there are so many different devices now, and mm -hmm. that's something that I recommend you look for um, if you're looking for a WordPress theme. 
I'm assuming Square Space and um, Shopify um, that they have responsive um, capabilities built in already. Um, mm -hmm. But um, you want to look for what's called a responsive theme. Um, so basically, what that is is it just allows the the uh, site to sort of morph so that it looks good on all devices. And I'm sure you guys, you know, all have smartphones and all have used them to browse to, um, you know, all kinds of different sites. And some work great and some work work like crap. And uh, you definitely want um, your site to be working on all devices. Uh, Google actually just announced that they are um, going to now penalize um, sites that don't work well on uh, mobile devices. Um, mm -hmm. There's, if you just Google that article, you can read about it. And it sounds scary, but it's not really that big a deal, especially if you pick a WordPress theme or um, a website service that has that built in already. Um, so I guess I sort of diverted from your original question. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. I think the the mobile thing is definitely really important, um, and it, the the idea was oh, so the question that I had was, what do you think the biggest obstacles are from translating what you've researched and what you want into an actual project? Um, I don't know. I don't know exactly how to answer what the obstacles are, but. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you are, I mean, I'm assuming since you all are artists that you're visual people, I would recommend that you do some kind of mock-up. Um, you could draw it. You, If you have access to Photoshop or Photoshop Elements um, or another image editing program like that, you could do a mock-up in there. Um, mm -hmm. You could even do it in Adobe Illustrator if you have that. Um, I think it's just going to help you realize, you know, figure out exactly what you want your site to look like. Mm -hmm. um, but then there is the, the challenge of translating it to the actual um, website, of course. Um, you know, most likely, the majority of you probably aren't going to be hand coding a WordPress theme or an HTML site from scratch. So you kind of you kind of want to look at your theme choices, and you know, I think that I haven't looked at all the themes that Corey recommends. I'm sure they're all pretty good. Um, but do your own re research too, um, and find out, you know, what theme you want to use, and then maybe sort of create a mock-up based on that theme, so you can kind of tie the two together and have an idea of where things are going to go and how things are going to translate once you're actually creating the website itself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, and and I love your idea of doing a mock-up of actually drawing it out. Um, you know, and if you're not if you're not skilled with Photoshop or Illustrator, I think that's not necessarily a deal breaker. I've seen uh, website mockups done in pencil. Uh, so I, you know, if you can give your designer something that is visual, um, then then it you'll get much closer to what you actually want at the end. Okay, um, so a few design elements that. A uh, few design elements that are critical to all websites. Uh, you need a good home page, and the home page, I see a lot of artists, and I don't know why this happens. A lot of times an artist's uh, home page will just feature, like, a photo of the artist and a bunch of text, and that is, you know, maybe their artist statement or, you know, and a big, long explanation of the work. Um, visually speaking, the, the, the Internet is a visual medium, and people, generally speaking, don't read very much online. So if you're putting a bunch of, like, if your website loads and it's a big block of text, um, you're going to lose probably more than half the people immediately. Um, and if the text is, like, small and hard to read, you're going to lose the other 30 or 40% of them uh, within a couple sentences. So I, w I always recommend for artists that your homepage should feature your work, your best work, the very best stuff that you have should be on the homepage. And then there should be some sort of a call to action. It should be join my mailing list or click here to you know to pr to to browse my available pieces that you can buy. Um, so the homepage should be all about that call to action and impressing people. 
Um, and keep in mind, too, that most website visitors don't actually enter the website through the home page. Uh, the home page is, uh, you know, it's your big impressive page, but most people actually discover a website because they find a link to a particular piece of work that they like, or they read a blog post that they like, and then they go to the home page. So um, that's your, your first chance to give people a, an impression of the overall of what, you, of what you're all about and tell people what they should be doing while, while they're on your website. Um, your about page, uh, obviously very important on your website. People want to know who you are. Uh, they want to know why they should care. And one of the biggest challenges that I see with the about pages is uh, bio, bios written in third person. You know, Corey Huff is a very snooty artist who can't be bothered to talk directly to his clientele. <laughs> uh, the web is a personal medium uh, as well as a visual medium. And the about page, the, the secret to a really good about page, one that actually turns people into clients and buyers, is to make it not about you, but about them, um, to, dress, to address their needs directly. Uh, so if you are an artist who, for example, if you're selling work that is a good fit for interior design, uh, and maybe your target audience is interior designers who are going to fit your work into their clientele's homes, uh, then you want to speak directly to that interior designer. Um, so maybe the about page says, you know, hello, thanks for being here. Um, you know, I know I know that as an interior designer, you have X, Y, and Z challenges, and uh, you know, I've worked with interior designers, blah blah blah, and uh, I help them solve these challenges by doing X, Y, and Z. And uh, here's what you can do if if you want to work with me to help solve that problem. Um, in the artist website checklist, there is a link to Kimberly Houston's uh, guide on how to write a good about page. Oh, actually, it's not in there. So let me find it, and uh, I'll share a link to it on the event page, and when we, when we upload the video, I'll, I'll put a link to it there as well. Um, I, think that, I think that artist statements as about pages are a terrible idea, and I usually tell artists, if you're going to have an artist statement, stick it at the bottom of your, of your about page, or even better, uh, have a secondary page um, that is maybe a drop-down from your About page that you can send people to, because the only people who care about artist statements are art schools and juried shows, and occasionally you'll get a, a, a higher-end gallery that wants a, a formal artist statement. Uh, in, that, in those cases, you can send those people directly to that page, so you have the artist statement, you can send them there. But um, most people don't care about those very academic, dry artist statements that don't actually say anything. All right. Um, let's see. Okay, so the next uh, piece on the... Okay, so your image galleries. This is where we're going to start getting into some specific stuff. So uh, the image galleries... Um, Image galleries for artists are a, a subject of a great deal of debate. Uh, you know, you can walk through the checklist and look at the bullet points that I put out. You should have large, shareable images, uh, at least 500 pixels wide, I think, uh, if not wider. Um, you know, you'll see a lot of thumbnails, small thumbnails, and I'm not a fan of small thumbnails, but at, you know, at the very least, you should be able to click on the thumbnail and blow it up into something that is very large and wide so that people uh, can follow it and, or so people can see all the detail, right? Um, if you'll notice on e-commerce sites like Anthropology, my wife, my wife shops at Anthropology, and uh, if you go to Anthropology's website, uh, when you click through to any of the pieces of clothing or art that Anthropology sh uh, sells, you can actually mouse over the art itself and there will be like a magnification effect where it shows you a close-up of, I'm like, shows you a close-up of, um, the art so that you can see the details, so you can see the, the quality of the fabric, uh, et cetera. If you can do that with your website, that is the ideal situation uh, for, for your art so that people can actually see what they're getting um, and they'll get excited about what's there. Now, obviously, colors differ between monitors and between, uh, you know, people see things different on their devices, the size of the screen, all that kind of stuff. But giving yourself the widest possible biggest possible image that will load quickly uh, for your 
for the people on your website. That's probably the, the ideal uh, scenario. Okay. Um, and then talking about loading images quickly. Uh, so if you, before you upload your images to your website, you should be rendering them in Photoshop or uh, I can, you can do it in preview if you're on a Mac. I don't know what the Mac, uh, what the Windows version of that is. Uh, but you basically want to set the resolution size to 72 dpi. If you don't know what that means, then when you're saving the image, you want to look for uh, size and resolution settings and then looking for, look for something that says dpi and just change that to 72. Uh, and then it'll be uh, a small enough file that it will load quickly on a mobile device or on, on your computer. Um, okay, so Tiffany, you asked, um, how can I make sure that each URL or each image on my website gets its own URL? So uh, I'm going to share my screen here and show you what I mean. So oops. if I go to, let's just go to, uh, I'm going to pick an artist friend of mine, Melissa Dinwiddie. We're going to look at her calligraphy art at ketubaworks.com. So we're going to shop, Ketuba prints. So this is a site built in WordPress. And here's the, uh, she's using WooCommerce to build this, I believe. And in WooCommerce, when you upload a product uh, into WooCommerce and fill out all the information, uh, then you get uh, a page that looks like this. It's a list of all the products. And you can see the URL up at the top. It says ketubaworks.com slash product category slash ketuba prints. You click on any of these, and it opens the page ketubaworks.com slash product slash arts, crafts, roses, ketuba. Um, so this is what I mean when I say each image should have its own URL. Basically, each image should have its own page. So if you're using WordPress, you want to use something like WooCommerce um, to create a product section in your website. And there's lots of other, there's lots of alternatives to WooCommerce, but WooCommerce is the most popular WordPress e-commerce plugin. Um, there's a few others. There's uh, WordPress e-commerce and Goldcart and a handful of others, but that's the one that I use use myself and recommend. So, I take any, that. <laughs> yeah, you recommend it too, Julia. Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. I've used it for clients as well, not just yeah. myself. And lots of it, it, it's very flexible. There's lots of add-ons that are free, and you can purchase and make it do anything you want it to do. Cool, Tiffany. If you can, uh, you can unmute yourself, and we can chat about it for a second. You've meet, there you can go. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Um, have you pulled up my website? I think it might be easier to explain. Sure. Uh, here we go. TiffanyCruzBauer.com. Okay. Okay. So the template that I chose through Squarespace um, doesn't allow the individual URL in the gallery feature because I picked that um, layout predominantly for being able to organize my work into series mm -hmm. um, and to kind of explain the story that I want to tell in each series. Mm -hmm. um, but under the shop link at the top, every piece has its own individual. So like this is my balloon series mm -hmm. and at the top it explains the series and then it explains each piece, but you can't mm -hmm. click on that and open it in a light box. But yeah. each piece has a link to the shop Mm -hmm. And that will open an image in the shop that has its own unique URL, and you can click open and see it bigger. Right. Um, and this is the link that I post on social media anyways. Mm -hmm. So if you think it's necessary to go in, I think there's a way to go in and, and change that gal the way the gallery's organized. Do you think it's worth it, or do you think I should just keep the, mm -hmm. the way well, it's I'm not sure why you have this page at all. Okay. I mean, so I, I know you've got the I know you've got the explanation here, mm -hmm. but you can just as easily put the explanation on this page. Right, which I do. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see. That's what you're saying. Yeah. The series explanation. Yeah. Um, you can put the the series explanation, you know, down here at the bottom or something. I think my 
my goal was to kind of organize, I have like a tree series and then a balloon series and I'm working on a seven deadly sin series and it, it kind of helps tell the story if they're all together, sort of. I don't know. Maybe mm-hmm. that's just you. Well, <laughs> well, it does. I think I think it, it would tell the story, but um, having to scroll through them like this is sort of the opposite of what you want to do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Now, I say that, and let me show you... Oops. I, I think that that page is not exactly what you're going for. A lot of the other um, uh, templates that were on there, I really didn't like because the images were just these squ- like square, square, square in this mm-hmm. weird grid, and my colors are so different. They it was really com- they were competing. So mm-hmm. yeah, and I also um, didn't want one of those where you had to press the arrow over, over, sure. over. Sure. Um. So. It, like I, I understand what you're trying to do yeah. here. Uh, you want to give people an idea of journeying through your series, and uh, and and this is sort of a, an elementary version of that. Uh-huh. Um, have you ever looked at the New York Times Snowfall no. uh, story? No. Okay, you should be able to see this on my screen. Okay. Um, and I'm going to share a link to this on the events page. All right. So uh, when this came out a few years ago, when the New York Times Snowfall story came out a few years ago, it was revolutionary web design, and now it's extremely common. It's everywhere, um, and it's called parallax design, right? And as I scroll through it, you'll start to see what I mean. So you'll okay. see the images there, um, and you'll start to see like embedded media in the page. Like there's video here that talks about the story. Mm-hmm. And um, now, obviously, this is a much bigger story than any of your individual individual series, but you can do something similar to this, where you've got video embedded in this in the story, so you can tell the story of the series in a much deeper level, while letting the the art be there as, as, to illustrate each point. Right. Okay. I'm not saying you have to do this. You don't have to do parallax design. You certainly don't have to do ads. Um, I'm just saying, this it, like like this is a lot more visually interesting than this. Okay. Um, I think, Julia, yeah. do you have any any thoughts? Well, I sort of agree with you. Um, mm-hmm. With the New York Times article, obviously, there's a ton and ton of text because it's a long, mm-hmm. long story. Um, so, as a blanket statement. I don't agree with you that <laughs> it's more interesting, but yeah, that parallax, parallax um, style is extremely popular right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so is, I, it kind of, is it kind of following the idea it's kind of bloggy and journalistic and mm-hmm. it's telling the story and then, oh, here's where you can buy it or here's where you can do this or here's more about it, here's a picture. and mm-hmm. I yeah. also have the blog, so yeah. I'm doing... I think I think that you can do what you're trying to do on that page with a blog post. Okay. Yeah, and okay. then you and then in that blog post you can link to all of the images as you talk about them. Okay, and then just have it right. just a generic gallery. I think so. I think it, I think I think it'll simplify it. Okay. Uh, I don't know, Julie. Do you have any thoughts there? Um, I I think I I think I agree with you on that. It's hard for me to say since I'm not. Um, super familiar. You said you're using Squarespace, right? Yeah. 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 I'm not. I'm. I don't have any experience with. But it seems like in theory, what you're saying, Corey, would work. Yeah. Yeah. Especially. It felt, like kind of, it felt like I was doing kind of double work, where you know I'm doing the story on the blogs, but then there was one on the gallery. So that's why I wanted to ask that. But I like your feedback. I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna change it to where it's just a regular gallery. Okay. And I think, and I have one more question, then I'm done. My um, individual share buttons. Mm-hmm. I think Squarespace only allows it to be on blog posts and um, the shop. Mm-hmm. So, do you know of a software program I could use to put them in the gallery, so it's right there? If someone ends up on that page through Pinterest or something, then mm-hmm. it's. Or how um, can I put them in? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know that much about the Squarespace platform. Uh, I would suggest reaching out to uh, their support team. Uh, they they will probably be able to help you. Have you have you asked their customer support? No, I haven't yet. Okay. Yeah, if you're a paying Squarespace customer, uh, you should be able to ask their team, and they should be able to give you something good. Yeah, they're great. Thanks for okay. your input. Yeah, you bet. Okay, I'm trying to open the vent with my toes so that I can get some air here. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm going to flip back over to the events page and see what people are saying here. Is it okay to have an article news events page as opposed to a blog? Um, is interaction so important on the website? Man, that's a great question, Carmen. Um, yes, it's important to have the interactive element on your website. That's my opinion. Uh, that said, there are lots of artists who don't, but most of those artists who do not have interactive sections on their website, it's usually because they're already famous and they don't have time to manage comments or to or to blog, um, and their work sells without it, uh, or they don't have a blog and they're not going anywhere. Uh, that's that's uh, an oversimplification. Uh, it, it's not necessary. You can you can certainly build an art career without a blog, but in addition to missing out on opportunities to connect with your collectors you're also missing out on an opportunity to connect with the wider conversation about things that are happening in the art world. Right now, there's a really interesting conversation happening around uh, Marie Abramovich's piece at the MoMA, at, at the uh, New York City MoMA, um, and there's lots of blog posts written about it, um, about her, about Klaus Biesenbach, the curator, uh, and, and about... Uh, the new piece from Bjork. Uh, there's a lot of interesting conversation happening around that. Um, so it, you know, you can go to the MoMA blog. You can go to Greg.org. There's uh, he's a, a pretty well-known artist, and uh, and and read his take. And what happens is all these artists that are out there blogging, they're they're not just talking about what's going on with them. They're also responding to what's happening in the art world, what's happening with collectors, what's happening in their careers, and it creates this conversation that's happening from blog to blog, from social social site to social site, and it behooves you as a professional to at least be aware of that conversation it, and, and, and even better to participate in that conversation so that you can think about your profession and be become known by other people in your profession. Let's see. Uh, Beth Sawicki says, my web, shop, my web shop is from Fine Art America and embedded into my site. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, this, is, this is actually pretty smart. I'm going to share my screen. So uh, for those of you who don't know, Fine Art America is a website that sells prints on demand. So you can upload high-resolution versions of your images to their website, and then they will handle, when somebody buys something, they will print it and ship it for you. Uh, and then they take a 30% commission. So the, the Beth Sawicki has signed up for Fine Art America, and what Fine Art America has done is they've, they've created uh, sort of like the ability to embed a YouTube video. They've, they've given you the ability to embed your Fine Art America store on your website. So you don't. So on your website, if somebody could, uh, we're at bethsawicki.com. Somebody clicks on store, and they're on her Fine Art America page, and they can see all of the prints that she has for sale. Now the challenge here is that if I decide that I want to buy one of these prints, it's actually going to take me over to the Fine Art America page eventually. Here we go. And once I actually hit checkout, it's gonna, the whole thing is going to go through Fine Art America. And then the customer information is actually owned by Fine Art America. So Beth Sawicki doesn't actually get the person's email address, so she can't follow up with them. But it is an easy way to get a store up and running on your website. I wouldn't recommend doing that for the long term, but it is an easy way to get started. Do you know, Corey, if uh, you can make 
tweaks to the look and feel of that um, Fine Art in America widget. Oh. So no, the fonts easy. don't match, the fonts don't match. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. I, I, I think you might be able to make some minor font changes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's actually a choice of a handful of fonts, but you know, if you've got some obscure font on your website, it's not going to match. Uh, yeah. okay. Jamie, did you have something to say? No. Oh, okay. Uh, I tried to say that you can change colors. You can change colors with the Fine Art America page? Yeah. Okay, great. If you're about fonts. Great. Okay. So we talked about image galleries and stores. Um, I talked about blogs a little bit. Uh, on the checklist, I've got uh, some links to a handful of uh, blog posts that I've written about why blogging is important and uh, how to do it effectively. Um, this is a, a, a good moment for me to throw out that if you are watching this and you haven't signed up for the Content Marketing for Artists uh, course yet, uh, I would highly recommend you do so. Uh, we start the course next week, Monday, April 6th, and it's an eight-week course designed to help artists go from, uh, I've only ever sold a, a, ha a handful of pieces of art, one or two pieces or something, to being on their way to having a full-time career. Uh, you can sign up and find out more about the class at theabundantartist.com slash content. Um, you can find out more there, or if you have more questions here, I'm happy to, uh, happy to answer any of those questions here if you have them. Uh, okay, so moving on, let's see. Okay, going back to talk, back to text. So, uh, I showed you the Snowfall example of breaking up the text with video and drop quotes and things like that. Um, I see a lot of artist websites that are like size 9 font and it's just like a huge block of text. Um, don't do that. People don't read on the web, uh, and especially if the, if the text is hard to read. So break it up. Use, use larger font. I usually recommend size 14 point or higher. Julie, you're probably going to kill me for saying that. Um, what it, what why I know a lot of designers don't like large font. Maybe you can it, do you agree or disagree there? I think that that is a trend that has changed a little bit recently. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think it, it totally depends on the font that you're using. I mean, all fonts are different. I mean, one font it might be fine to use twelve or fourteen, but other fonts you might want to go sixteen or eighteen. I mean, it seems like in general, I've seen fonts getting bigger and bigger. Um, mm -hmm. It, it also depends on your audience. You know, if you're selling to, you know, people in their 60s and 70s, um, you might want to go bigger just to be sensitive to their eyes. So size 18 Comic Sans, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Don't use Comic Sans. <laughs> don't use Papyrus. <laughs> All right. Um, where were we? Okay, so a few things that I'm... I, I don't see this as much anymore, but I still see some of these things with artist websites, like things like having music or videos that autoplay as soon as your website loads. Please don't do that. Um, consider, consider all of the people who are looking at your work while they're at work. Uh, they're looking at your art as a way of distracting themselves or daydreaming. Uh, if, if, you're, if you've got music that starts playing, um, especially if it's something really loud and obnoxious, uh, that just disrupts every, everybody around them. Um, and they're just going to close your website. Uh, so, so, you know, it's, it's not just a matter of respect. It's a matter of keeping them on your website. So if you have music, make sure it doesn't autoplay um, and, uh, because you're just going to get rid of them. Uh, mouse effects, like turning the person's cursor into, like, a running hamster or something like that. I, I still see that every once in a while. Don't do that. It, it's, uh, it's just not professional. Um, the exception to that is... Uh, I actually have seen a couple of artist websites where it's it works really well because it's part of the overall brand of the artist, but ninety I feel like ninety nine percent of the time you should not do gimmicky stuff like that um, as a rule unless you know exactly what you're doing. Um, get rid of third party advertising if your art if your art website has like ads for web hosting on it, uh, don't. You're, you're, you're there to sell your stuff, and having ads for other stuff uh, 
is a little strange. You know, unless you're unless you are an art teacher, and you are uh, telling people, you know, you're, and you're teaching people how to paint different things, and you've got ads for paint supplies and stuff like that, or ads for other classes from other teachers. That might make sense. But as a general rule, if you're if the if the purpose of your artist website is to sell your art, uh, don't advertise other stuff that isn't your art. Okay. Um, Jan says, don't you make much more money selling your own prints than selling through Fine Art America? Sure, uh, Jan, the, the, the Fine Art America will take a 30% commission off of whatever price, uh, they'll add 30% rather onto whatever price you set uh, for, the, for the work that you upload. So sure, you'll make, you'll make more uh, of the total price if you sell the prints yourself. The trade-off is uh, you don't have to build an e-commerce site and they handle all of the printing and shipping for you. And for myself, and for a lot of artists that I know, that 30% is worth all of the work for the printing and shipping. Um, and now, the challenge, of course, is that you don't get the contact information for the people you sell to, and that's not as good of a trade-off. But uh, as far as the actual money that's coming to you, you know, unless you really love the printmaking process and the shipping and all that stuff, uh, I think print-on-demand is a pretty good trade-off especially for only 30% of the, of the piece. Okay. Um, so the rest of this, the checklist, I'm just going to leave to everybody there. It's just uh, these sort of check boxes to make, making sure you have each element of your website there. What I'd like to do now is, for those of you who are here, if you uh, would like me to look at your website, uh, if you're in the discussion here, uh, feel free to submit your, your URL or on the events page, go ahead and uh, post your URL, and we'll take a look at some websites for the next 40 minutes or so uh, and, and see if we can't help some people make some improvements. Hey, Corey. Yeah. I had a, a quick question about um, collector pages. I've seen a couple artists do this where uh, uh, the artist gives out, like, codes to their collectors to access a, a private page on their site just for the collectors of their art. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what they put in there, but it's probably like special, like behind the scenes photos or something. What What do you think about those types of pages? Yeah, that's a great that's a that's a great idea. Um, so I know an artist uh, in Montana who used to do something like that. Her name's uh, Amber Jean, and Amber lives sort of out in the middle of nowhere in Montana. And she would uh, she had a it was called the Patron page on her website. And people who uh, paid her, I think it was 60 bucks a year or something like that. Uh, it's been a few years, so I don't remember all the details. But uh, people who pay her a certain yearly fee, they get private access to that section of the website. And so they, pipe, they type, type in their password, they go in there, and there's a private blog uh, there. And there are early look pictures at the work, at the work that she's putting together. Uh, so people who are enthusiastic enough to join her patron program, uh, they not only get uh, a first look at any art that she has coming up, which means that they're going to be they're going to know if they want it and they're going to be able to bid on it first before it goes to market. Um, but they also she also has it like bonuses, like if you join, you get one hand drawn small hand drawn piece from her each year. Uh, there's some other things that she's done like that. So, yeah, I think, is that is that what you're talking about, Jamie? Because I've seen a number of artists do stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was talking about. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's a great idea. I, I think you have to be somewhat careful with it. Uh, if you are an artist who doesn't have much of an audience, then uh, it, it can be hard to get people in the door. You don't want to lock your stuff down to the point where the only way people can see your work is is through your, your patron program. So there's a balance there to be between marketing and and creating exclusivity. You have to do enough to make people aware that you have an exclusivity program. Right. Yeah. Cool. Jamie, where, where in the world are you? Uh, Santa Barbara, California. Santa Barbara. Are you uh, you're young? Are you still in art school? No, I'm, I'm a full-time graphic designer, and mm -hmm. I'm trying to start my own um, uh, fine art selling stuff that I do, so that's what I'm trying cool. to do. Awesome, man. Well, I best of luck. I, I hope that uh, works out. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so Jan. Oh. Oh, okay, that's because I don't have the right name here. Jan, Jan C. Watford Fine Art. 
dot com. Here we go. Jan C. Watford Fine Art dot com. So I'm going to share my screen here so that we can get right down to it. All right, Jan. Uh, so looking at your website and so loads. You've got a newsletter opt-in here. Join our newsletter for special discounts and announcements. Um, I'm wondering if you can be more specific than that, Jan. Are you are you are you tracking whether or not this hello bar at the top is working? Are you getting newsletter opt-ins? Jan, are you still there? Yes. Okay. Are you getting newsletter opt-ins from this hello bar? Yeah, if you can hear me, yeah, I'm not getting any sign-ups from okay. it at all. Okay. And I really have plans. I want to do like a little ebook and mm -hmm. uh, maybe you know. How much traffic? Did, how much it, traffic? But I don't know how to do that, and uh, so. Do you know how much traffic your website has right now, Jan? It's not much. Hardly anything. My other website's doing much better. Oh, so you have a you have a second website. Yeah, I have one for my books and illustrations because a long time ago uh, you had mm -hmm. advised me about splitting them up, so I made mm -hmm. a different website for it. Right. Okay. And uh, and so that website is doing doing better. Is that your your primary business? Well, I'm trying to make this my primary business too, uh -huh. but it's just not getting a lot of flow of traffic. Okay. And I'm assuming that you're sending people from that other website to 